All right. Uh, so yeah, once again, it's predicting temporal intention in social media and in ritual sharing. Uh, this work is actually the culmination of my doctoral work. So yay, I'm a PhD now, so awesome. Um, so before we start here, I'm talking about temporal intention and resource sharing. So what is intention and what's, uh, how it's related to time and so on. In order to explain this, this actually this paper is a follow-up study to a paper I published last year, um, or a year and a half ago. Uh, and I'm taking it a bit further. In order to start actually explaining what's going on, let's revert a little bit to the uh, very beginning. Um, what is intention? Let's check out this tweet, for example, here. Uh, Heather Rieger or something are talking about the H1N1 um, virus outbreak in 2009. Of, uh, in 2009, and she's linking to the WHO pay, uh, Age and saying that the latest count for casualties of people who died is 47. When you check out this tweet a couple of years later, that doesn't match. So in this case here, Heather or Saunders here wanted you to check out the, the state of that web page at that point in time, in June 2009. Furthermore, for example here, uh, if you are checking out this, uh, this tweet, and you see here it's a, a an ad for checking out the latest news in the news or newsletter and so on. So whenever you click on this link, you want to see the latest update, the latest version of this web page. So what what's the difference between those two? Those two are two normal tweets talking about two the, uh, like web pages. What's the difference between them? Difference here is intention. All right, the author had intended for you to see two different versions in this case of the web resource. Web resources change through time quite extensively and quite a lot. So, but we figured out in our previous study that intention is highly subjective. So we simplified the problem. Instead of a uh, subjective problem, we mapped it to, to sim uh, like simpler problems of relevance and change where we can actually measure. So to understand this, let's go through these four scenarios. Here, this is a tweet published by uh, Pfizer in their, uh, in their account and saying check out the latest news. In this case, they want you, they intend for you to see the late, the, the whatever current version of the, sorry, whatever current version of the resource at any point in time when you click on it. Today, next year, it doesn't matter. So the resource continuously change, the relevance is still intact. So the intention here is for the current version. Let's put it in this quadrant here for this mapping. Second, scenario here, Jeff, it's so sad that Michael Jackson died in 2009 and he's linking to CNN.com. At that time, it was a breaking news and the CNN.com webpage was covered with all this news. But if you click on it, it's completely changed. So here the resource has changed and it's no longer relevant to the tweet. So the author here wanted you to check out the past version. Let's, play. Let's place it here. Furthermore, this is the more common uh, scenario. Someone uh, tweeting about an article they read. So the article is still intact and, and it's still relevant. So you want to see the past version where they saw it, but you'll be okay if you got the current version. Finally, the case of spam, when the content has not changed and it has never been relevant, and this is quite often in, in spam. So with these four, we have mapped the intention in regards to the versioning of the web page uh, through time by two simpler, easier to, uh, to measure components, which is relevance and change. So we built this uh, data collection uh, and we collected tweets in English. We took a snapshot of the web resources at the point in time that's closest to the tweet time, and the current version, and we collected 10 mementos in the middle, and, all, uh, and we collected several other uh, uh, points of data. So furthermore, okay, we took this collection, we placed the tweet in order to ask what is the intention behind it, what is the relevance behind it, we put the tweet and next to it the current state of the resource at this point in time and we ask Mechanical Turk workers, uh, Mechanical Turk it's, um, um, I can't remember anyone. So <laughs> Mechanical Turk it's, uh, you collect the uh, user data, user uh, applied data from crowdsourcing um, and we ask them a simpler question, is it relevant, is it still talking about the same topic or not? And we collected this, uh, this assignment. We performed several feature extractions in regards to the tweet, the resource, 
the different stages of those two, and uh, we collect 39 different features, and we build our model, which we call it TURF. And this, uh, these are the results. But if you notice here, there is a huge recall bias towards the non-relevant class. And here, this is the classifier that we built based on the 39 features that we extracted to, to uh, classify if it's relevant or not relevant, add to is the change measure, and we can get the intention. So we decided in this work to take it a bit further. We analyzed the, the top features in, in information gain or informa uh, in gain ratio. We found that existence of celebrities in tweets. If people are talking about celebrities, they mean mostly contemporary stuff. Uh, someone talking about Lady Gaga, not about her history. She doesn't have a history. Tweet similarity with the current page is also quite intriguing. If the tweet is somehow verbal, uh, not um, linguistically similar to the web page that you are checking, that's that's also of high value. So we took it a bit further uh, by asking ourselves, how can we enhance this? So. We enhance it into those four different angles. Uh, we enhance our model in those four different angles. We start by a linguistic feature analysis. We realized, okay, the wording of how someone writes a tweet or how they link it to the content of, of the web page is, is a lot. It's like, it, it's one of the most very, uh, the most strongest features that you can actually measure. So we started by further analyzing and dissecting the tweet itself. Does it have hashtag? Does it have uh, user mentions? Has exclamation points? Has emoticons? Uh, beside, priorly, we actually measured the sentiment, uh, the, sentiment um, the most prominent sentiment in the tweet and how they convey. Uh, is it a retweet? All of this tweet structure analysis is very, very simple. And also we went further by detecting what are the parts of speech? What is the tense of, uh, of, uh, of the tweet? Are they talking about the past? future or the present. All of this relates to, the, to how they relate to the link that they are mentioning in this specific tweet. Furthermore, are they talking about a movie or a sports team or a product or a geolocation or something like that? And do they have entities in the tweets or not? Furthermore, also the type of the tweet matters. And how, like, uh, some tweets are interactions between people uh, socially, some people are conveying opinions, some are just plainly updating their status. Which ones affect which class? So we, we put this in our account as well. Furthermore, um, following up the, the, the prior talk in regards to uh, topic modeling and the detecting its similarities, what we did before is when we want to uh, measure similarity, we did the cosine similarity between the tweet and the current, uh, the, the current state of the resource, or the past state of the resource and the current uh, state. We, yes, we, we clean the HTML, we remove the boilerplate, but still. Here, for example, on Michael Jackson, the story evolves. The words evolve. Yes, there is Michael, there is Jackson, but there are other things as well. Right? They suspect it's not a suicide, maybe it's a murder. So the, the words change through time, but the topic is almost the same. So from, instead of cosine similarity, we actually used LDA in order to detect the latent models, uh, the latent topics from beneath. So we used LDA into actually measuring topical similarity rather than literal word-for-word -word similarity that you can get from cosine similarity. Furthermore, if you notice here, from the prior experiment um, from Mechanical Turk uh, uh, assignments, we get the relevant and non-relevant classes, and that's how we trained our classifier. It's already inherently biased towards the relevant class with 80 to 20 uh, divide, which is very, very biased. So one of two options here, either to, in order to balance the data set between those two classes, either to slash the relevant assignments and take only 20% uh, or, or the, the first 200 of them or at random or something like that, or increase uh, the non-relevant assignments. We did this by actually oversampling and using SMART uh, technique that has, uh, I'm sorry, synthetic minority, minority oversampling, and we increase the data set and balance it this way. So after all the enhan enhancement, after all the features, the new features uh, that we extracted after the balancing and changing the, the similarity measure, we actually increased uh, the performance in, in both uh, in recall and precision for both classes significantly. And that was exciting, but there was a problem. We went a little bit crazy here. Here, from 39, we went to 65 features. That's a lot. 
uh, and actually for one tweet that's, co that's connected to our resource, it can take up to seven, eight minutes in order to calculate what are all the features and give you a good decision of the intention. No one is gonna wait for that. No one, like you're posting a tweet and going to the bathroom or grab a coffee or something to come back to get the decision, no one does that. So in order to do this, we, we try to measure, okay, what if I eliminated some of those features? Which ones are the best ones to pick? And there is also the trade-off between how fast you can calculate it and what is the, the information gain that comes from every feature. So as a preliminary study, we here we eliminated uh, 40 features and kept only the first 25. And we know there's only a decrease in 2%, which is completely acceptable in this case. So we enhanced them. All right, and these are some of the, um, the features here. The existence of celebrity is a linguistic feature and how we extract it and so on, and what is the rank in the information here. Okay, so far I can train very, very well um, a model to, to detect if it's relevant or non-relevant, get the perfect similarity, get the perfect state if it's a current intention or a past intention. But so far it's been binary. This is current, this is past. But how current is it? How past? If it, can I get a middle ground in the middle? So we needed to get more, not black and white, a little bit measurement in gray. So what we have here, we have a similarity measure. We can calculate that. And we have a relevancy uh, confidence or that comes from the classifier. Our goal is to find the strength of intention in, uh, with respect to those two um, those two measures that vary from negative one to one. So, remember this, we're gonna map it here. If you check out this graph, the x-axis here is change. From here, it's actually shifted, uh, the, the axis, are, the point of origin is shifted. But here, from a zero to one, it's not changed to change. The y-axis is the relevance, from zero non-relevant to relevant completely. If you check out this point S here, this is the point of strong current intention. It's completely changed, the page completely changed, but it's still completely relevant. So the author wants you to see the current version most definitely, okay? But in the middle here, point C, it's, it's somehow changed and it's somehow relevant but not relevant, so this is what we call the confusion point. And if I have a new um, tweet or resource pair in this point here, I want to measure how far is it from the, uh, from the confusion uh, in relevance to the, the line between the confusion point and the strength point. And that's my, my, strength, my normalized strength. So I'm not gonna go into how the formulation here and all of that, you can find it in the, the paper, but what we got is we formalized, uh, yeah, formulized intention and we got an intention strength measure from negative one to one that perfectly uh, signifies the difference and actually could be utilized further on. So, next stage, we, uh, we, uh, we calculated the intention strength for all the samples, all the tweet resource pairs that we have in our data set, our training data set, and followed like a sigmoid function, which was quite interesting. Beyond that, in order to actually visualize is my intention strength actually working or not, let's check out a, a sample of the, of the tweets that are within the data set. Here, for example, remember this is the first tweet that we started with, Heather talking about uh, H1N1 um, out, outbreak at that point is 47. The intention strength that has been calculated is negative 0.82, uh, which is 82% uh, confident that I want you to go to the past, the, the green is the past intention, which is in the negatives. Furthermore, here someone talking about a new startup and they have a new project. The intention strength is 73% towards the current so he is 73% confident that you should check out the current version. Okay, we calculated the tension strength. But does it change? Like someone tweeted about this three years ago. Did the intention strength change and shift through time? Or is it completely stable across time? If it's stable, all right, everyone is happy. We'll take a snapshot at the, at the point of tweeting and we're cool with it. Apparently it's not. So in order to do this, our preliminary analysis suggested that we need to do an, an, a further understanding or further analysis to this. So back to our data collection, back to our data set, we have a collection of tweets, 
Each one of them is connected to a resource, and the resource we have the past version at the point that it was tweeted, and the current version, which is three year, three and a half years after that at this point in time. And we have 10 mementos from this period. So if you look at it, we have actually 12 snapshots of how the resource changed through three and a half years. This, this is when it was tweeted, and this is right now when we started the, the experiment, and we have 12 snapshots. So we calculated the intention strength for every instance of the data set across all of these uh, 12 samples or 12 snapshots. And we wanted to inspect how the strength change and shifts. So we conducted, this is the framework of the, of the analysis of the calculation, and this is what we found. In some cases, someone tweeted about something like Pfizer thing. Uh, the Pfizer tweet wanted you to check out the latest news, the latest update. So it's steady that always through time, the last three and a half years, they want you to check the current version of the resource. Here, steady in the past, that's all to give an example for this. But this is what we are intrigued by. It shifted through time. It was a current intention, like when you, you are reading the story, this is the current version that you want to check out, but at one point in time, it completely shifted. The intention of the author was due towards the past. Like, so that, that's actually a good example when, when we further checked out, uh, checked the data set itself. We found that this example with Michael Jackson is from this category of changing. It actually perfectly maps our, uh, matches our intuition. Like someone is uh, tweeting saying Michael Jackson has died. In the very beginning, the first month, CNN.com was covering the, the news story at all points in time. Like, uh, simply to your, uh, similar to your example, the NSA scandal, it was matching, but then the story shifts. Here, CNN.com just abandoned this, uh, this story and went to a uh, more interesting topic further on, further on. So the intention shifted towards the past in this case. So, the big question, can we predict this, uh, this uh, behavior or this class of behavior in the very beginning? while you are tweeting about something, can I predict that this intention is gonna change? That's what we're trying to do here. So given <coughs> these, uh, these 12 uh, instances or 12, 12 snapshots through time in a measure of three and a half years, we train a classifier based on those features that we extracted, and we found that we can actually correctly classify it in 89% of the cases. But that with the knowledge of all the features that, and all the snapshots through three and a half, uh, three and a half years. What if we elim eliminated the following ones, like only kept the first version of the, uh, the first snapshot of the resource and the first tweet? Can we do a prediction? Actually we did, yes. By eliminating all those features, keeping all the linguistic features that we were able to extract from the document at that point in time, and the, the features that we can extract from the tweet, like is it talking about celebrities, is it talking in the past tense or the current tense or the future, um, does it talk about a product or a movie and all of these, all of these features if we eliminated all the other ones and kept only the ones that we can calculate till the point that I'm pressing the tweet button, in three out of four cases, in 77% of the cases we can actually give you a prediction. So, and this is our, our uh, prediction classifier, these are very cool and uh, precision, but I'm running out of time, so let me give you, this is the implementation that we performed, actually. So here, this is a tweet, and uh, this is the outcome of our implementation. It gives you the analysis, the extracted URL, and the state, here in this case it's steady, not changing, towards the current with 60% confidence. Here, this is the, the, the very original uh, tweet, the state is unsteady, it will change with 60% also confidence that it's gonna, uh, gonna change through time. And this is only with the knowledge that at this point in time, when Heather was writing this tweet, and this is a prototype that we actually working on in a, a web app, integrating our prediction model into this, uh, while pressing the, the, button to, the tweet button, it will cal uh, calculate the features and give you the options here. Do you wanna just send this link as is, or take a snapshot of the current state of the resource and link to it instead and tell the readers, this is the current state of the resource at that point in time, and that by, by this you maintain that temporal consistency through, web, through the web and you will never like, have this time grid. And finally, um, 
I'm not quite sure if the URL actually matches, but um, I'm going to send it as a tweet later. So this is actually a service that is up and running. You can write your tweet that has a bit.ly URL, and it can give you the prediction of how it's going to re react within a year or two in time. So thank you, and thank you for indulging me. So. Questions? <laughs> That clear? Awesome. <laughs> I'd like to hear a little, little more about your experience with, with Mechanical Turk. Did you, did you do any kind of cross, any any validation on the responses or? Actually, yes. We are, like in the previous paper, we spread a whole section of how not to conduct an experiment on Mechanical Turk because uh, measuring um, intention is highly subjective, and the concept of time. We are very well aware of time that work changes. If you tell anyone else that CNN page change, you're like, yeah, okay, but I don't know what rate. But if you told them that, uh, for example, uh, Professor Nelson's web page changes, okay, how often? They don't even understand sometimes the concept of change and different in time and all of that. So when we conducted the previous experiments of what is the intention in time in this regard, it was a complete disaster. It was worse than flipping a coin. So we had to actually better understand our subject, better understand how people think in order to map it to relevance instead. So yeah, but we did a lot of validation in the middle and, and we got some data, gold standard data from our group. Yeah. And, uh, um, I, I was just going to interject um, our gold standard data set for the tweets and, and their R classified intention is available on archive yep. somewhere. Yeah. If other people want to mess with that. Yeah, it's attached with the, with the, <coughs> of the previous paper on archive. Um, all the data sets, all the training data, and everything. Yeah. Uh, why do you need to have the links uh, on school with the, I think Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's actually a good question. Repeat question, too. Yes. Uh, he was asking why do we have uh, to, to use this to have uh, the, the URL shortened in Bitly? Because actually, you are mining for the click logs from Bitly API because most of the shortening services don't have that and Bitly, your, uh, Bitly API actually can provide you this how many clicks on which which day and this is actually one of the features. I didn't want to go to, into, into depth with all of that but one of the features is when this URL uh, have been uh, first shortened, first created, how many clicks that it got in the very first uh, couple of days for, uh, versus later on and so on. So that's why we are using it for now. Open for improvement. How oh, well does this feature work? Or is this essential? I'm sorry? Uh, is this feature essential? Because uh, we have collected the uh, information. <laughs> we can eliminate it, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's, um, it's one of the features that are actually ranked high in the information game. That's why we kept it. So. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? Well, then thank you to both our speakers for very timely presentations. Awesome.